and we discuss and we were closing in on the shallow water equations and geostrophic adjustment, right? So what it, what do I need? To, what do you need to know about? What are some of the things to know about the shallow water equations? Because we're going to build from those today. And geostrophic adjustment. It's a terrible illustration there, but anyway. <laughs> equations are like the simplest rotating fluid model mm -hmm. you can really do. Mm -hmm. So they're like, they're useful in that they're the easiest to solve. Sure. And they have a, so basically, and what, so what asymptotic limit do they apply in? This is almost their name. Shallow water. So what does shallow mean? So, so Put H and L up here. What does shallow mean? H is much smaller than L. So the depth is much smaller than the horizontal length scales of interest. So if there are waves, the waves are very long compared to their height. Right? That's the kind of thing we mean for shallow water equations. And what kind of waves are in the shallow water equations? That we talked about a little? Kelvin waves. There are also Rossby waves. We haven't talked about those much. And then there are gravity waves. Gravity waves are the only ones that we've actually talked about the speed of. Everybody remember the speed of gravity waves? Square root of GH. So this is real. Well, so how fast is this in the ocean? This is kind of a fun thing to do. How big is G? 10 meters per second squared. And how big is H? 4,000. No, we're not. We're talking about the whole thing. For, the, for, the, for this part, that's exactly what I want to get at it. We have to use the reduced gravity equations if we want to talk about the mixed layer only. We'll do that in just a second. But this, if I'm using the whole G, I'm talking about the whole depth. Okay, so 4,000 meters. So one, two, three, four, square root of four <laughs> times 10 to the fourth, which even I can do the square root of that, <laughs> times 10 to the two. <laughs> um, how fast is that? And these are in meters per second. These are meters. Meters per second. So what's 200 meters per second? How fast is that? So what's something you might know that travels at 200 meters per second? An airplane. So these are extremely fast. This is what tsunamis are. They're full depth, shallow water waves. And they travel across the Pacific in a matter of 10, 12 hours. I mean, that's how fast these things are. Okay, so if we are solving a set of equations that have things that are pinging around this fast, what is that going to do to our time steps? Does everybody know the CFL limit, the Courant Friedrichs Levy limit? It says that the grid scale over the time step, this has to be, let's see, make sure I get it right, greater. So this is, in order to have numerical stability, basically the crossing time it takes for a signal to cross a grid cell in your numerical model versus the time step of your numerical model has to be faster than the fastest traveling thing in your system, the fastest traveling signal, otherwise it blows up. So if this thing is fast enough to cross the whole Pacific in a matter of hours, what does that mean about our time step in our model? Very, yeah, either low horizontal resolution or very, very fast time steps. So what this means is that if we solve the shallow water equations, we're going to have to have very rapid time steps in order to capture this signal. So one thing we could do is we could use the reduced gravity shallow water equations and only worry about the surface. 
we saw that the equations, the shallow water equations in reduced gravity look like what? What changes? G changes to be G prime, where G prime is something like that, which is, sorry, <laughs> which is the density difference above the non-moving layer versus the density of the non-moving layer in times g. So how much might that be? How much does the density change in the ocean versus the background density level? Very small. Very small. That was the basis of our Boussinesque approximation. So for something like the mixed layer base, this might be 1% of g. So say that. And also, now we're talking about the thickness of the active layer, which might be the pictocline or might be the mixed layer or something. But in any case, it's going to be a smaller h, just write it that way for now, which is probably only, say, order, let's go 1,000 meters. So I can still take the square root. This is important. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so we just dropped two orders of magnitude because of this. And we, the 4 becomes a 1. So now, 1 times, or 10 meters per second. This is still very fast compared to a typical ocean velocity, but it's not ridiculously fast. So this it would be manageable. The planetary geostrophic and quasi-geostrophic equations are an even better approximation than this because they do what we did at the end of the geostrophic adjustment problem. So geostrophic adjustment, how did it work? We put a blob of stuff in, or an initial condition that was not in geostrophic balance, and then what do we do? Exactly. So we let the waves, the gravity waves, all propagate away and look for the geostrophically balanced conditions that had the same potential vorticity as the initial condition. So when we go to the geostrophic equations, we're going to do that. We're just going to forget about everything that's not geostrophically balanced, or at least almost everything. Leading order, we're going to be geostrophically balanced, so we're not even going to solve for the gravity waves at all. We're only going to solve for the slower moving geostrophic phenomenon, which means we're not even going to have to deal with this reduced gravity thing. So in a shallow water system that resolves the surface, you might have a 10-minute time step. In a reduced gravity one, or a, you know, like if it was a, say, a 100-kilometer grid, you would have a 10 to the 4th second time step. So that's like a few hours. In a QG, or planetary geostrophic model, you could have a time step that was a week. And so for the same horizontal resolution, you can everything is moving slower, so it's easier to take bigger chunks. So the planetary geostrophic equations, the quasi-geostrophic equations, just like the Boussinesque equations filtered out sound waves and made it numerically more efficient to solve, the planetary geostrophic and quasi-geostrophic equations are going to filter out gravity waves and make it more efficient to solve. So we're only looking at the slower things. So what kind of applications are good to only look at the slower things? Energy transport climate change, paleoclimate, that kind of stuff. Obviously, we can't solve maybe coastal problems like tsunamis and wave inundation and flooding because all the gravity waves that do that stuff are missing from the system. They're not totally missing exactly. We won't really go into great detail with this, but we'll see. At least I will tell you now that what happens is, is they just become infinitely fast. So the 
geostrophic adjustment becomes instantaneous in those systems. So we don't ever consider initial conditions that aren't already in geostrophic balance. We just to say, all that other stuff is gone first. And when we force the system, we never push it away from geostrophic balance. We just work hard on the boundary conditions to only force the geostrophic modes. It turned out in weather prediction, this is a really complicated thing because you collect observations that say, like, the state of the system is this, and it's got lots of gravity waves and crazy things and noise in it, and if you just initialize the model that way, most models will blow up. So there's a lot of pre-treatment of the observations to make sure that they're not overly exciting all these other things, sound waves, gravity waves, et cetera. So one of the big fancy things about data assimilation is trying to manage the fast modes versus the slow modes. <laughs> so, one last thing, because this is cool. So, um, what's his name? Lewis Fry Richardson. So Richardson number, remember we talked about that? So in the 1920s, maybe, maybe teens, 19 whatever, 15s, um, he decided he wanted to do a numerical weather forecast. Um, so he discretized the equations in motion and got a room full of calculators, that is, people with adding machines, <laughs> and they tried to calculate a weather forecast for Europe, and it blew up. It did not actually converge to the right weather. And the reason why, two reasons why, one, because they didn't know about separating the gravity waves out of the system and using the quasi-geostrophic equations of motion we're going to talk about later. If he had used the quasi-geostrophic equations, his forecast might have worked, but he used the full shallow water equations because he didn't know any better. And secondarily, the CFL, Courant Friedrichs Levy, this came in the 1920s. So they didn't even know that you had to limit your time step to make it work. And it was so elaborate to make one calculation that they didn't, it wasn't like they were going to just change the time step and rerun because it was like a room full of people working for weeks at a time to try and do this for one forecast. So anyway, that's the beginning. Um, when we, after we get to cute quasi-geostrophic equations, which will probably be on Wednesday, we'll talk a little bit about the first successful weather forecasts that were done at Princeton in the 50s using the quasi-geostrophic equation. So, all right. True. So in the atmosphere, the quasi-geostrophic equations are not as big of a speed up. In the ocean, um, one, one meter a second would be a really fast phenomenon. So when we're in the way that this traditionally happened was um, when computers were not very fast, people just didn't simulate the ocean at all. Or they just simulated it just as an absorbing layer. They didn't give it currents and they didn't give it waves so that they could take, so they didn't have to worry about it. But if you want to do a coupled system like a climate forecast, it would have been very, in the early days, it was very difficult to do that because of the fast and slow time scales. So you had to run, if you wanted to run a 100 year forecast, a 100 year projection, that would have been impossible doing both the, the fast modes of the atmosphere and the slow modes of the ocean, essentially. So it's a very stiff problem. It still is a problem for data assimilation now. We still don't really know how to assimilate atmosphere and ocean observations together into a coupled climate model. It's sort of not quite done, and it's because of the separation of time scales between the atmospheric winds and the ocean currents and the different balances that come out in the heat capacity. So it's not as big of a problem for, for, for weather forecasts anymore. But in the beginning, this was a big part of it. And so the quasi-geostrophic equations were invented actually by Charney for his PhD thesis to do a instability problem, which is what we're going to work on next week. But they were the basis for the first weather forecast because they sped up all of this because you could get away without simulating the gravity waves. It made it a more stable system. OK, cool. Yeah.
Oops. Close this down. Okay, so we're gonna. This, this is what we're gonna talk about this week. So first, we're gonna talk about a scaling set for the shallow water equations. Secondarily, we're gonna talk about the planetary geostrophic equations. Then we'll talk about the quasi-geostrophic equations. So these are three versions of the shallow water equations. These two are slightly different. Planetary geostrophic is supposed to make you think really, really big scale, like size of the planet. Quasi-geostrophic equations are supposed to make you think it's not exactly geostrophic, it's quasi-geostrophic. <laughs> that seems sort of semantic. But that's actually what these equations describe. This one is exactly geostrophic, but it only applies on very large scales. When you get to slightly smaller scales, the deviations from geostrophy are what we're gonna solve for. It'll still be geostrophic at leading order, but then the correction will be, will be, we'll have to solve for. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the continuously stratified versions, and then we'll, talk a, we'll close talking about Ekman layers, which is uh, our first example of a boundary layer we're gonna talk about, and so it's, an ageostrophic, it's kind of the simplest ageostrophic case to think about. Okay? Um, we're doing all this non dimensionalization. We're not really using numerical models yet. I'm sure we're going to really use numerical models, but in practice, all of these systems are solved on numerical models. So when we talk about resolution, it's important to think of the resolution maybe not in terms of an abstract L, but like the grid scale of your numerical model is a good way to come up with the Rossby number. This will be important when we talk about subgrid sub scale schemes after we're done with the basic equations. Okay, so which equations are these? These are tangent plane equations. What approximations have been made to get here? We talked about these before. So is this the full mass equation? Yes, no approximations there. This is adiabatic, so the temperature equation is a little bit simplified. These two are talking about the same thing. What's the difference between them? Or zero or small for the hydrostatic balance to be approximate. And this one, the vertical velocity, is just as big or Im contributes importantly to those. So this is the non-hydrostatic equation. This is the hydrostatic equation. And then what about these guys? There's actually another approximation in this and these, which we'll get to in a second. So what kind of a, this is a rotating system, but what kind of a rotating system? It's like a rotating table. It's not on a sphere, it's a local tangent plane. And because we don't see any Coriolis terms in the vertical equation, we've made the traditional approximation, which is we're assuming that the rotation axis is locally vertical. So it appears only in these equations. F doesn't have to be constant. F could have a small variation, which is called the beta plane. That's a little extension away. So if you like, on the Earth, talking about that kind of a system, and then you could either assume that F was constant there or maybe it's a little faster on this end or this end, which is a little hard to think about. Sometimes I think of them as, well, it's like, is it that solid, this thing, this sort of lampshade thing, which would be like a nice beta plane, or is it, <laughs> is it a cylinder, but with the rotation rate that's the local vertical rotation rate? It's not an easy geometry for either one of them, but they're Taylor series approximations of the full rotation and spherical coordinates. Okay, so then Boussinesque equations, what happens between that last one and Boussinesque? What gets approximated? Pressure. The pressure and really the density equation, the mass continuity equation from this complicated thing becomes incompressibility, and along with that, the pressure becomes simplified, which means that the buoyancy just appears here. And so we're not thinking about real density compressibility anymore. We just think something that's 
less dense is just buoyant, but it isn't actually less dense. That's all it does is it pops to the surface or sinks down depending on its buoyancy. It doesn't actually fill more or less volume. Um, and so we can either write a thermodynamic equation for the buoyancy or we could write the buoyancy in the ocean in terms of temperature and salinity and then there's a functional relationship between them. So this is a closed set. So we're going to build off of these when we go to the continuously stratified equations. We're going to build off the shallow water equations, the other ones. Do I have the shallow water equations? No. And this is, again, this crazy paper. You can do all of this without making most of those approximations and still go through the same machinery, keeping all the diffusivities and things if you like. It's just way more complicated. And then the shallow water equations. So what happened here? Why is it a U instead of a V? What does Valis mean by U? The horizontal. This is the horizontal pieces. And then what happened to the buoyancy equation? Or the incompressibility equation? It's hidden in these. It's because we integrate vertically. So now we don't have, we have a uniform density, uniform buoyancy layer. It's got a top and a bottom. Its thickness is H. And so we're just evolving it based on its thickness. So it's sort of a implicitly vertically integrated equation. And that we can do that because if it's uniform buoyancy throughout the layer, what does the Taylor-Proudman theorem tell us? It won't shear. That it'll move around like big columns. Yeah, and so even the shallow water equations apply even if that's not true, even if you're not in a strongly rotating system, but in a strongly rotating system, it's it, an extremely good approximation to assume that there's no shear. And so the Taylor Proudman theorem helps us believe these equations are actually more useful for the kinds of systems or rapidly rotating systems we're looking at. Okay. All right. So remember, this is our plunger problem, where we're forcing the sea surface height up and down here. And waves are coming away from it. And if you could see these little vectors, which you can't see, they're rotating around in circles. So these are rotating surface gravity waves. And they're fast. But if we just drop a blob of water, we get rotating gravity waves that propagate away. And then what's left? A geostrophic, in this case it's this way, so it's an anticyclone, so it's a high. So the extra pressure, some of the pressure stays behind, some of it propagates away. So in the geostrophic adjustment problem, we're not solving for the waves, we're just solving for this guy. And this guy has virtually the same potential, at least in the linearized approximation, has the same potential vorticity as the initial condition. So if we could write an equation for the evolution of the potential vorticity, we could write an equation for the evolution of this eddy without having all those waves on top. That's what we're going to try and do. Um, why didn't you see in the plunger case, why wasn't there much of a geostrophic? Why wasn't there a geostrophic anomaly there in the plunger case? What's different between the blob drop and the plunger? Exactly. So the plunger has a frequency, and though I didn't tell you all the parameters, in this case, the f plunger frequency was high enough that my temporal Rossby number, where this is the period of oscillation, was actually big. So my Coriolis force was relatively small. Um, but in the blob drop, the period is from the beginning until the end of time. And so the, the time scale could be very, very small, could be very, very long. Oh, I'm getting myself confused here. It's hard to think of it as a frequency. It's a big problem. So the anomaly is there for a long time, so there is a, a slow time response. 
In fact, one of the big controlling parameters in the blob drop is not the is not a time, it's the size. So how long it takes for the gravity waves to propagate away, how long it would take for that anomaly to propagate out. So this is not only projecting onto all times because it's an impulse, but it's a big enough anomaly, it's many thousands of meters wide, that in this system it actually, well, by the time the gravity waves have propagated across it, there was multiple rotations, and so the geostrophic flow could set itself up. So the conditions for, the, for geostrophy to apply are either slow frequencies, so that you have multiple rotations per period, or very large scales compared to the gravity wave propagation speed so that your so that or the very large scales so that your Rossby number F U over F L is small. So these are the kinds of things you want to have right. I should have had that in red over there. smaller than one of the first two. This is that one. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is a this is one over a Rossby number. This is a different Rossby number. This is the evective Rossby number. We want them I had it right the first time. One over that. <laughs> it's the Rossby number. It's supposed to be less than one. <laughs> so the uh, small Rossby number is what we're after. And we could either think of it as a time period if there's a periodic forcing, or we could think of it as U over L being our, setting our time scale. So large scales or long time periods. Everybody on board with that? Okay. So let's scale the shallow water equations then. So Here's the shallow water equation. So, how? So we come up with some horizontal length scale, some velocity scale, and basically push all of these equations through. The only real assumption here, in between this and this, is that the time scale is the same as u, as uh, l over u. So it's an invective time scale to get from there to there. And then what happens between these two terms, which has the Coriolis parameter and the gravity in it? We can scale for u with u. We can scale for the gradient of h with some size of the variation scale of h, which isn't necessarily the total depth. It's the variation scale versus the horizontal length scale. And so how big is this guy, this variation scale? This is where the geostrophy part comes in. So which, what's the balance here for geostrophy? Which terms are important? Coriolis force. Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force. So these two are both supposed to be the same size for a geostrophic system. These two are supposed to be smaller. So if we want to make these two the same size, that tells us actually how big this curly H is. Curly H is F U L over G. And then if you do some algebra, you can rewrite that as the Rossby number times F squared L squared over G, or the Rossby number times the height, mean height, times L squared over LD squared. And LD in this system is the square root G times the total depth over F. Oh. How big is this thing for the ocean, say? So this is a big question about whether it's reduced gravity or not. So another way to say this is the distance that a gravity wave propagates in one pendulum day. So if we use the fast one, the 200 meters per second divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 4, it's about 200, no, 20,000 kilometers. I got it right. 20,000 to the minus 4. 
200 times 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the 6, $20,000. 200000 ton. No, yes, 2000 So it's very, very big. <laughs> is the, is the, let's see. 2 times 10 to the 2, which is what we figured out before, divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 4, which is 2 times 10 to the 6. So 2 million meters, 2,000 kilometers. Yes. So two. So that's really, really big. But we could have done this with the geostrophic, uh, with, with the reduced gravity system, and then we would have gotten something close to maybe 20 to 100 kilometers because of the point 0.1 that came in here and the shallower depth here. So we should be careful when we're interpreting whether we are bigger or smaller than the deformation radius. If we're in the reduced gravity system, we have a relatively small deformation radius. If we're in the full depth equation, we have a pretty big deformation radius. So we want to think that through as we're going. But because the shallow water system looks the same, whether we write it in reduced gravity or not, we don't have to do anything different in the math. We just have to interpret LD correctly. Everybody on board with that? OK. So Valis uses these funny little hats when he has removed the dimensions off with a dimensional parameter. So here is the shallow water equation where all of these are written dimensionlessly, without dimensions, maybe a better way to put it, without dimensions. So, and everything is now supposed to be an order one quantity because all the dimensions have been pulled out front. And the only difference between this and this is that he basically just pulls all those pieces together using this assumption for that. But so, what does this tell you, this set? There's the Rossby number. There's only one not dimensionless parameter is the Rossby number. So what is the limiting case when the Rossby number is small? Geostrophic. And when it's large, ageostrophic. Right? OK. What about the thickness equation? We need to scale that, too. So if we take this form, then we have both the average depth plus a variation in depth. And so the average depth doesn't appear here. Why not? It doesn't have a time derivative or a spatial derivative. So the advection of it is zero. And here is the average depth or the variation in depth more important? The average because it's bigger than the variation, kind of by assumption from the shallow water equations. Horizontal variations are small. It means essentially that the average depth is deeper than the than the variations in depth. Okay, so we write it down this way, where he's divided through by the average depth, and you have a small factor plus a big factor, or an order of a one factor, and then you have a small factor here. So, what can I say about these? Well, if I use this math again, I can actually figure out the size of the variation to the total, and that gives me this crazy thing which is a Rossby times L over LD squared. And then there's an H out front. So rewriting that system, I've got this common factor, the Rossby L over LD squared, Rossby L over LD squared, which is also called the fruit number. So what does this system tell you? The Rossby number is really small. And L and LD are the same size, what do I get? Incompressible. incompressible, even stronger than that, horizontally incompressible. So remember the, all those homework problems that we talked about? How is W smaller than it's supposed to be? That's the limit we have here. So W is smaller than it's supposed to be in that limit. We're getting a horizontally incompressible system. But that's not the only limit that's in the shallow water equations. Even though the shallow water equations don't have much W, they have some W. So you can still horizontally compress under what conditions? When this thing is order one or above. 
So let's write that one down because that one's a useful one to have. So Ross B L over L D squared. If that is much less than one, then we have incompressible, horizontally in incompressible. When is that going to be violated? If the Rossby number is big, well, we're talking ge geostrophic in our other equations, the Rossby number is always small. So what can I do to make this number not small if the Rossby number is small? Large scale. So if L is much, much greater than LD, so much so, in fact, that it's LD times the square root of Rossby, then it could be compressible, even though geostrophic and compressible. So the planetary geostrophic equations are going to be in this limit. We're going to be much, much larger than the deformation radius, much, much larger than the deformation radius times the square root of Rossby, in fact, which is like slightly different. So if our Rossby number was 0.01, this would be you know, one tenth of that. So you could actually still be kind of deformation radius scale for small Rossby but we're big. So, okay. And in that case, we still keep the compression terms. Okay, so without approximations then, this is our shallow water equations just rewritten with those two scaling parameters. So the game now is to give me a specialized limit. It's called a distinguished limit for Rossby and L over LD that makes sense. So a distinguished limit means a limit which is distinguished by the fact that after you take it, the equation still makes sense. <laughs> it's distinguished by being sensible. Okay. And, oh, so now the question at this stage, which I'm supposed to ask you. What if we redo this and reduce gravity? What's going what's to change? just the meaning of the deformation radius. And the really powerful thing about the reduced gravity is that the form of the equations doesn't change. So we could have in reduced gravity system, planetary geostrophy would work on a much smaller scale. Okay, so that's part of the reason why it, why it makes sense. Okay, so planetary geostrophic and then we're gonna quit and we'll come back to quasi-geostrophic on Wednesday. Okay, so let's take Rossby number really, really small. Length scale, much, much bigger than deformation radius. No subtlety here. None of this like square root of Rossby messing around. So that this combination is order one. So this guy is gonna be about the same size as that, or L over LD squared is the same size as Rossby. So it's going to be this. Yeah, so are we going to be compressible or incompressible in the horizontal? Compressible, but not wildly compressible. <laughs> not These terms are totally bigger than this term. Just everybody in the whole system is preserved. Everybody could be the same size. And one of the things about scaling laws is that that's actually a safe way to go. If you don't throw any terms out, you actually haven't made any approximations. So you're still just kind of operating in the original system. So a better way to interpret this is not that these are exactly equal, just that we can't say one of these is way bigger than the other one. If it was, we would have a different set of equations. Does that make sense to everybody? And what about the Rossby number being small? What does that do? If we haven't changed this equation at all, what about that equation? It's geostrophy. So we throw away those terms. But remember what we talked about in geostrophy, how do you solve a system where there are no time derivatives in it? We have a time derivative in the H equation. So the way to talk about this system is I start with an initial height field. From that height field, I calculate a sea surface height. From that sea surface height, I calculate my velocities. 
I then use those velocities to advect my height around, and then I go back and do it again. So the system evolves only through changes in sea surface height. There's no, or thickness, if we're talking about the reduced gravity system. There's no momentum. The momentum is only determined by this. So the only thing that happens is, is high and low pressure systems, high and low sea surface heights are moving around. And in fact, this is kind of the system we talked about in the beginning. We said, oh, uh, an anticyclone is a high pressure, and so it advects other things around it anticyclonically. A cyclone is a low pressure anomaly, so it advects other things around it, like cyclonically. So if I just made you a, a little zoo, the way to think about planetary geography is that if I just made you a little zoo of you know pluses and minuses, and this is high, high and low pressure anomalies. So every time I have one of these, I have a cyclone infecting everything around it like this, and every time I have one of these, I have an anticyclone like this. And so this guy is making that one move that way, this guy is making that one move that way. It's a complicated sum, but that would be this equation. Because I have these pluses and minuses and their kind of topography of that sets my gradient of sea surface height. And then my velocity field is just governed by those sea surface height variations. And then I say, in the next time, when I take all those gradients and I move this one and move that one and do, the, do whatever I'm doing, and then I do it again. Then I play the game again. I calculate my sea surface height field. I calculate the velocities that come from it. And then I vector around. Does that make sense to everybody? That's what planetary geostrophy tells us. OK? And because we have both terms in this equation, these could collapse on each other and add up or cancel out. Like we can actually converge. The anomalies could merge into each other just by adding together their heights. But when we did the geostrophic adjustment problem, it, our game was a little different. We didn't use height, we used potential vorticity. And so there must be a potential vorticity in this system as well that makes sense to that. And why didn't I have to worry about gravity waves or any of that? We assume the geostrophic balance in the beginning. As soon as we have that height field, the only thing it's allowed to do is set up a geostrophic flow. It's not actually allowed to run away as a gravity wave. So the assumption of strict geostrophy has filtered out the gravity waves. They're not there anymore. Okay? So we don't have the geostrophic adjustment. It was already geostrophically adjusted at every instant. As soon as you determine the height field, it's geostrophically adjusted. And then it's advected by geostrophic flow, but it's assumed to be geostrophically adjusted again right at the next instant. There's no velocity independent of geostrophy, and there's no sea surface height independent of geostrophy. They're linked diagnostically. So you can't have gravity waves, which are ageostrophic. OK. We could also put, these, put those two equations together. And instead of this potential vorticity, we get this thing. Can, why is this? Why does that make sense? And actually, it should have a G there. This is a geostrophic direction. What's the approximation going from here to there? Rel small relative vorticity. But relative vorticity is another ratio of those two. This is a u over l thing, so it's just a small Rossby number. It's the same thing as saying that u over f l is less than 1, but we already built that in. And then the other piece that Ballas did wrong here is he should have put a small g here <laughs> and said that this was advection by the geostrophic flow. But it is the only velo ex advecting velocity in the system is the geostrophic flow. So this is potential vorticity. How is that 
and this related. Do the simple case where f is constant. So if I have the juice topic dt, f naught over h, what's that equal to? I can take the derivative. 1 over h squared minus f naught u by dt h. <laughs> I'm just going to get the same equation back that I had written down for the thickness part. If f was constant, except there's a convergence here, and this is hiding in this one. What is what does that come from? The only place the convergences are coming from here is the variations in f. So, geostrophic flow is horizontally non-divergent when f is constant, but if f varies, there's a small amount of convergence and divergence. That's what gives us the other part of the thickness equation. Okay, so we can pick back up there on Wednesday, and we'll see that that's a slightly different balance between PG and QG, how that part works out. So we'll think about that. In this system, you can have leading order divergence. We, we're not able to approximate this equation by throwing out this term or this term, but the leading order divergence only comes from the variations in F, not from the horizontal, not from the other, there's no freedom in the other equation. Okay. Are there any questions? I missed.